Hello, everyone. Um, my talk is more about specifics to a project called Hyperledger Fabric and, and less about the open source contribution project process, though I do cover that. And I, I can link you to all the, the slides, uh, the material, the uh, pages. Um, so who am I? Uh, my name is Morgan. I work for IBM. I work in the open source uh, side of a uh, division um, called DEG, Digital Experience Group, something like that. And uh, basically as part of this, what I do is I contribute to open source projects um, irrespective of the sort of IBM uh, product that might be using these, these, these projects. Um, and so that's my email, that's my Twitter. Uh, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions later. Uh, my history is uh, four or so years ago, I started working on the open source project Docker, which is containers, um, cloud native stuff. Uh, then from there, after a couple of years, I became, or I became a maintainer, and then after a couple of years, uh, I moved over to Kubernetes, as that's sort of the next big cloud native project. Uh, I did that for a couple of years and I wanted to move on. And so now I work on uh, Hyperledger Fabric, uh, which is a blockchain platform. And so hopefully you're familiar somewhat with the concept of blockchains, um, but I wanted to start by talking about Hyperledger. Uh, Hyperledger is a, is a sort of a sub foundation of the Linux Foundation. Um, these are many of the other foundations that uh, are under the Linux Foundation, including the, the CNCF Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Um, and I know I talk too fast, so if, you know, just wave at me if I'm talking too fast. Um, and so, as part of that, uh, the Hyperledger Project, uh, Hyperledger Foundation, also, oops, also, okay, also has uh, being a foundation, it has many projects underneath of it, um, and uh, they like to call this the Hyperledger Greenhouse, in that we add a bunch of projects and let the ones that uh, you know thrive grow. Um, and so they're split up into um, different uh, aspects of what they cover. And so uh, distributed ledgers is top box. Um, we have Burrow, which is a, a EVM implementation and a platform fully, fully baked uh, multi-node distributed platform for running Ethereum virtual machine contracts. Uh, we have Fabric, which is the topic, the subject of this discussion. Uh, we have Indy, which is a platform that manages identities. So, uh, you know, this would be pluggable and usable for uh, managing you know, the, the identity of different corporations or different people. Um, Aroha uh, is a focused on providing sort of libraries and a platform for applications to connect to. So it provides um, lots of sort of Android and web libraries to connect uh, up. And then Sawtooth uh, is uh, primarily from Intel, and the interesting thing there is they take advantage of the, the Intel SGX Secure Guard extensions uh, to provide something called proof of elapsed time um, for their consensus me mechanism, and uh, inside of it, which is also another copy of the Burrow EVM. Um, Libraries, Ares is one for, uh, again, identity. Uh, Quilt it implements interledger protocol in Java, which is how you might connect up multiple implementations of different uh, blockchain ledgers and uh, sort of agree across blockchains that uh, some state has been reached. Uh, Transact is a very new one uh, that is uh, poised to become a sort of a library to implement very low level uh, ledger implementations. Uh, Ursa is hopefully going to be our uh, sort of our crypto, crypto cryptography library that all of the uh, projects will eventually use. It is also very new, and I believe Sawtooth and Aroha have some integration with Ursa already. Um, oh, I press it again. Okay, Caliper is uh, benchmarking uh, Cello, and it will benchmark all the different ledgers. Um, Cello is for deployment of some of these ledgers on sort of cloud environment, so you can deploy a uh, fabric to a Kubernetes, for instance. Uh, Composer's going away, and that's just freshly deprecated. Uh, Explorer is just literally 
I, I have a blockchain, I want to connect to it and see all the blocks. Um, and then there's many new ones uh, uh, under labs, there's incubating projects, uh, I work on a couple of them. Um, and then the newest thing that's not on here is uh, Besu, which is another EVM implementation. All right, so what is Fabric? Fabric is the subject of my talk. Um, Fabric is the implementation, is a platform that implements a blockchain. Uh, primarily, uh, its goals were to be sort of a blockchain for business. And at the end, I have some uh, use cases and use case discussion. Um, but the idea of it is very different from the concepts that you see in something like Ethereum or uh, Bitcoin. Is we somewhat familiar with blockchains in general? Bitcoin, Ethereum, okay. I'm getting enough nods that I'm gonna continue. Um, so the difference here is that Hyperledger Fabric is a, is a permission network. You have to be known, uh, you have to um, have, a, have permission sort of to join and to participate in the network. Um, and this is good for businesses because businesses like to deal with people uh, who they know who they are, or businesses like to deal with other businesses. And that requires you to form a company and you know, there's government and legal stuff involved there. Um, Whereas the most crypto cryptocurrencies are sort of anonymous. You, you, you form a, pri a private key and then you use that to talk to the network and unless you explicitly link your private key with your, your name, you really don't know who that is. Um, again, enterprise, everything's modular. There's a consensus layer, a ledger layer, a layer for, the, again, the identity, which is called membership services, as well as the actual transaction processing parts of endorsement and validation are all pluggable and you can write plugins and you can change the code uh, for your particular use case to uh, either form a, when you form a consortium of, of companies or individuals to participate, you can uh, customize the, the network to your purpose. Um, and so the smart contracts themselves are written in uh, usually Go or JavaScript or Java. And those are more general purpose programming languages as opposed to in Ethereum has the, the EVM bytecode, the Ethereum virtual machine bytecode, um, which has multiple custom languages that compile to the EVM. Um, and Bitcoin sort of has a very, very uh, limited virtual machine built in that has been sort of abused to implement smart contracts. Um, Privacy, and so private, the aspect of that is uh, maybe you have data like uh, health data that you can't really publish among companies, but you want to ensure that uh, it is sort of on the blockchain and validated. And so Hyperledger has a concept of private data which can be used to um, used in a transaction to determine the outcome of the transaction and yet not be visible to other parties. Um, and this goes back into the permissioning model in that the permissions can be, uh, you know, here, there are sp specific keys and values, specific areas of the ledger that you're allowed to see, uh, you're allowed to interact with. Uh, interaction being, you know, make a new transaction or uh, join an existing uh, ledger or uh, add somebody else to the ledger. And so there's many different levels of permissioning and privacy that are available in Fabric. Um, again, it's not a cryptocurrency, so there's no concept of mining, so we have to use a different uh, mechanism for consensus. Um, and then the sort of execute order validate versus order execute, which is, uh, I'll go into the details of that, but basically most cryptocurrencies are, they collect a whole bunch of transactions into a block, and then they execute the block and whatever the output is, is done. Fabric does not operate that way. They execute the transactions first. Um, so we don't have, we're not gonna go through all these sections, we're gonna go through maybe the first two or three. And this is a high-level overview of what a fabric network might look like. Um, and basically what I want you to notice is that there are peers. Again, this is a, a thing that might be replicated a whole bunch. Um, there might be a client application, which is your, it's just your application that not, it needs to interact with the blockchain. Um, and so it will call, use the software development kit, SDK, to interact with the various uh, members of a network. And so what makes up a network? A network is made up of peers, which are the uh, computers, the nodes that do the actual work, and it's made up of the ordering service, which exists to establish consensus in the network. And so the ordering service is important uh, to be sort of seen as a service as it is, uh, you know, again, replicatable and uh, distributable such that you can scale to become more 
you know, support more transactions. Um, you guys don't have to take pictures. I can make sure you guys get all the slides, just FYI. So, uh, so uh, the last part is this, this part at the top where we call membership services. And so you can bring your own certificate authority or you can use a built-in one called Fabric CA, uh, which basically, it, it, the whole purpose of implementing that is that it understands uh, how a fabric network is formed and can sort of spit out the correct cryptographic material in the, uh, the, the correct places. Whereas uh, you're perfectly welcome to open SSL everything and you know, certificate signing and certificate, you know, all those different certificates and manage them yourself. Um, but the overall goal is that, again, permissioned, everybody is identified by their cryptographic material and thus you have to have a way to manage that. And so that's an important part of the network. Um, peer, the peer is the thing that, again, does the work. It endorses, it executes the work, and then it commits it to the ledger. Uh, the peer also contains the ledgers. Those are the official, um, the official source of the actual ledger is, is on the peers. Um, the peers execute the chain code, and the peers, again, maybe send out events to notify either other peers that they have new blocks, or to notify the client application that, hey, this transaction was aborted, or uh, not aborted, but not validated, or was uh, not a block. Um, this is basically the same picture in a different way, uh, such that I'm identifying the part that once you have a Fabric network up, the part in green is what your developers would interact with. They would write the smart contract that runs on the peer, and they would write the application to interact with that smart contract. Um, and, and so the smart contract is sort of providing an API. Um, and the API is, you know, it, the, the generic smart contract API is invoke, which is like do something. Uh, but once you get inside of the contract, you're allowed to basically do whatever you want. And so uh, the client has to know what is inside of the contract itself. Um, that's been made easier recently with the specifically the node version of the SDK, where you can sort of define the functions that your smart contract implements as a as sort of a JavaScript proto prototype, and then uh, it's sort of native JavaScript to just call and interact with the, the ledger once you have your, again, your access control set up, your, all of your crypto material so that you can, your TLS, so you can talk to uh, peers and orders. Um, so this is mainly a peer right here, and you can see the peer again runs the smart contract and interacts with the ledger. Uh, which is made up of, again, the blockchain, uh, which is basically just a series of uh, blocks that point backward in time as other blocks, and they contain transactions, and the transaction is the, the execution state. Um, and then, uh, as an optimization, the uh, final sort of, if you were to run all of the blocks forward in time to the current state, is called the thing called the world state, and that has its own database, and that's pluggable as just uh, level DB or cloud, uh, cloud, I can't remember what it's called, but there's a, you know, there's a smart database versus just a dumb key value store. Uh, but overall, the concept of the uh, ledger in Fabric is keys and values, and so a smart contract interacts with the ledger by doing gets and doing sets and doing uh, deletes, which is just a set with nothing. Um, but basically, the smart contract interacts with the world state during a transaction, uh, and at the end, when it finally gets validated, it is committed as a new block. And so, oh yeah, I'm sorry. Here's the here's the the specific ledger information. CouchDB. That's the that's the database. Um, and so, what 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 makes up the ledger for Fabric is simply uh, reads and writes. So, a transaction. The output of a transaction is nothing more than what did the transaction read and what did the transaction write? Um, and those are what is signed, sealed, and delivered to the order. And the order packages them up, sends them back to the uh, peer who will validate that the block is made up of valid transactions, validate each individual transaction inside, and then finally it will write uh, a new block and it will write the update to the world state. So the, the updates happen after you've actually run the transaction. They don't happen during it. Um, so this leads to some interesting decisions you have to make while writing your contracts. Um, so consensus. Consensus is 
a major process of any blockchain. Uh, we have to decide what is, what is the answer, what is the output of a transaction. Um, and Fabric does, the, does it in, a, in an interesting way compared to most cryptocurrencies in that we execute slash endorse all of our uh, transactions. Then we take all the transactions, package them up into blocks, we order them, and that is done by the ordering service. And then we validate all of the individual transactions as well as the um, block itself. So, quick demo of, not demo, but a, an example of what, what, what does this look like in, in practice. Um, uh, I didn't talk about endorsement policy, but the endorsement policy is the thing that says who must execute this? Who must endorse this individual transaction? And you know, from this purple box, you can see that the three blue guys are part of the, the set that must endorse the transaction, and the, and the gray ones don't care. Um, so what happens is the client, again, the client application will say, okay, it knows how to interpret the policy, and so it will, ex it will do what the policy says. It will say, okay, I gotta submit to these three guys, so I'm gonna take my transaction, or, uh, I'm going to take my request, I'm going to package it up in this thing called a transaction request, and I'm going to submit it. And so that transaction proposal goes to each of the, uh, the peers. And the peers will execute this proposal, uh, and uh, during that execution they will record well, what has been read and what has been written to the ledger. Again, that's the, the core state of, of any blockchain. What, what are we doing here? And so uh, the they, they, they do that execution, they collect these reads and writes, they sign it with their cryptographic material, their, their uh, signature, and they send it back to the client. And so the client will collect all of these endorsements, it maybe does some logic that says, okay, do all of these three things actually agree on what the read set and write set is? That's a simple validation because if they don't agree, there's no point in going on to the next step because it'll be thrown away later, but it collects all of these things, uh, and takes all of these uh, signed pieces of material and submits them to the ordering service. And uh, during indiv any individual uh, block formation time period, uh, the orderer will be collecting other transactions and packaging them up, packaging them up into a block. And part of what the ordering uh, service does is it, it determines the order of the transactions in the block. That is important. Uh, for the validation stage. So once it does that, the ordering service creates the new block, and we have the block with a star on it, and, uh, and then it distributes this block to all of the peers, because all of the peers need to have a copy of the blockchain. Um, alternatively, depending on the setup, the uh, ordering service might submit it only to certain peers, and then uh, any individual organization running some of these peers might rely on uh, the peers to talk to each other uh, internally, sort of on a maybe a firewall network to distribute the block. That way, you only have to expose one one guy. Um, and there are different types of ordering service. Solo is basically there's a single non-fault tolerant node. If it goes down, you're you're not uh, happy. But that is mainly intended for development. Um, Kafka is basically you have to run this entire extra set of processes, this entire other Kafka service to hold your uh, order and then Raft, which is built into the peers itself, and it's the newest uh, one, which is sort of recommended going forward and does not require any out-of-process people to do your ordering service, and it is more customizable in terms of who might belong to an individual piece. Wow, I'm running out of time. Okay, um, then the, ex the, the peers, they see this new block. They get this block, and they go through it transaction by transaction and validate each individual transaction. And what does that mean? Uh, remember the read sets and the write sets. So imagine two uh, transactions uh, don't, or, you know, read or write from the same block, uh, uh, same key value. Then that is a conflict, right? And so what happens is whoever's first in that order wins, and that's the purpose of the ordering service to establish the order. So uh, during this process, what happens is it will take the read set and the write set, update the world state. Read set, write set, update the world state. And if a transaction does an invalid operation on the world state, that transaction is marked invalid in the block, and the world state is not updated, but we move on to the next transaction, keep going, until we get to all of them. And so at the end, you have a block that will be in the actual ledger that has an invalid transaction in it. 
And that's okay uh, because, again, it doesn't affect the world state. So maybe it's something you want to keep an eye on if you're executing a lot of transactions that you don't end up with a lot of invalid transactions. But it is good to see what are people doing, sort of a, a historical, what, is, what has been asked to be executed on this network, right? Um, so it provides that, that information. And then obviously, once we're done, a bunch of events go out to whoever's listening uh, to tell them, hey, a new block has been made. Block hash, blah, 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 ask for it. Okay, so that's that part. Um, we covered this, uh, so I'm gonna move on. But again, solo, single for development. Kafka, uh, out of process implementation where you need an odd number of nodes. Raft, uh, built into the peers. Uh, with more crash fault tolerance. Um, channels is just, this is, a, is an idea of uh, maybe you have peers, uh, you have, as your, your company interacts with many different companies, uh, and the companies you inter interact with are not necessarily part of the same uh, network concept, and so a channel is a way that you can sort of do business with one, got one company over here, and then do a business with a different company uh, using the same um, the same peers. So it allows you to, or, or maybe you do different business with the same company. You say, okay, this is my uh, lettuce uh, channel and this is my uh, toy bicycle channel. And, and those are the transactions that you run on each of them. Uh, so they're separated, but they may do the same operations just with different objects. Um, let's see, chain codes are tied to channels. So we see, let's just go to the interesting one. Uh, you can see that there's a different subsets that run the blue chain code versus the red chain code. And the, uh, the red, and you know, that's the quick version of that. Contributing, okay, so open source, excellent, great. Uh, Hyperledger came, uh, Hyperledger fabric came out of IBM as literally it was called Hyperledger, but it was contributed to a foundation which is now called Hyperledger and so we renamed the project to Hyperledger Fabric, um, and contributing is, is very easy. Um, I mean, it's not easy, but it's, it's easy to get started. Um, you need a Linux Foundation account. Um, some people don't like using their social media information, so they still support d direct emails, which is good. Um, we use Rocket Chat for our sort of live chat ops. Um, there's, mail there's a mailing list, there's a wiki. Uh, Jira is sort of the issue tracker. Um, I hope you're seeing a pattern that it's blah.hyperledger.org. Um, so go to hyperledger.org for more information on everything. And Garrett is, some of the project use Garrett, and I think we're moving away from it soon. Um, but primarily everything is Git based. Uh, everything is synced to GitHub. So there's a Hyperledger org on GitHub with all the project information in it. Um, if you are interested in getting started immediately, uh, what I would suggest looking for are these uh, examples called build your first network, um, develop your first application. Um, these require Docker to run and they run entirely locally after you pull down like a gig and a half of images, but you know, you gotta get started somewhere. Um, and then uh, you might use something like uh, Cello to actually deploy a, a live instance to a, a cloud environment. Um, let's see, what else do we got? Oh yeah, here's read the docs is where all of the Hyperledger Fabric documentation is. Um, in there is actually a page that says, uh, you know, contributions welcome, and I was, I was just going there and reading that. Um, I, again, I work for IBM, so we publish a lot of uh, material called patterns, which is examples of code uh, that you can take and run yourself and adapt to your personal situations. Um, and we have an entire section for blockchain, um, as well as the dev center that is focused on uh, if you want to sort of uh, figure out if you need a consultant for blockchain provided by IBM. Um, and then we have an actual service called IBP, IBM Blockchain Platform, and that is literally a deployment of Fabric on our Kubernetes service. Um, and so there are ways to provision Fabric on Kubernetes that we have internally. Uh, and Cello is the main one that is sort of external use to deploy a fabric onto Kubernetes. Um, and then use case, yes. Uh, there's an entire, there's actually another, a part of 
one of those previous links is there's an entire, uh, you know, there's like drop downs and there's like 50 or 75 use cases that describe how different companies are using blockchain. Um, one of the ones we like to discuss is called Food Trust. Um, it started with Walmart, and the story was basically, you know, some higher level management came to a guy and said, here's a box of mangoes, tell me where these mangoes came from. And it took them, you know, a couple of weeks to figure out, okay, these, you know, tracking that entire uh, chain of custody back to the original position uh, took a while. And so uh, they implemented a blockchain network and they uh, uh, took that network and connected to all of their suppliers. And so now they can trace these uh, shipments uh, all the way back to their source in, you know, seconds because it, they go to the network and the network has all of that information. Um, and so some of what you might think is, oh, well, couldn't we just do that? You know, yes, you could probably do this with a normal database, but you would not have the sort of cryptographic identities and the, um, you know, the, the, the actual transactions that have been processed to uh, audit the entire state changes that have happened the entire time. Um, and so there, there's definitely uh, part of the process that has helped. Maybe they just looked at it and programmed it into a computer for the first time and now they could do it uh, uh, faster. Um, but the blockchain part does help in terms of the, the reputation and the, the storage of the actual history. Um, and so why might you want to do this again is contamination or spoilage or uh, other kind of uh, you know, compromise that might happen to your stuff during the process. You want to be able to track, okay, where did this one instance of this box come from uh, and then go back to where it came from and then say, okay, maybe all of these are contaminated. Let's go specifically to the stores that we distributed all of this stuff to and not just say, um, at least in, in the U.S., sometimes they'll be like, okay, spinach is bad right now. It's got E. coli or something. And so they just, they just recall the, all the spinach in the entire country because they don't know which particular batch, where it came from, and they just, oh, okay, it's all gone. <laughs> um, and so this, this helps audit more specifically uh, which pieces might need to be recalled. Um, other industries. So one of the ones I like is um, the sort of the, the, the real estate industry, uh, tracking of uh, actual individual plots of real estate. Eventually, like 100 years ago, it was you know thousands of acres owned by one person, and then over time it gets split up and split up and split up and split up. And so uh, there's, at least in the US, you go to City Hall and you, you, you basically get a big stack of papers that say, okay, in 1850, this was owned by whatever. In 1851, it was split up into two parts and goes forward all the way into your particular house if you own a house. It's, it's your particular piece, and it's it's you know one paragraph that says now you own it. Um, and so that's an interesting thing that could be helped because then you wouldn't have to go through the entire uh, history of of the paper trail. And that's about it for me. <laughs>